What I'm planning to uh, cover today is, first of all, what do we call oligometastatic? There are various definitions. definitions. Um, should we be treating the primary? Should we be treating the metastases? So the definition of oligometastatic disease, I think, is used most commonly, is known as the Chartra definition. And this was published by Sweeney in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015 in a trial that combined uh, androgen deprivation plus or minus six cycles of docetaxel for metastatic disease. And they defined high volume as the presence of visceral metastases or four or more bone lesions with more than one beyond the vertebral bodies and pelvis. And the corollary of this is that low volume means no visceral mass, up to three bone lesions, if one or more is outside the pelvis and vertebra. But there's no limit on the number of lesions provided all of them are located in the pelvis or the vertebrae. And we see guys with bone scans with the whole pelvis and everything, you know, it's all in the axial skeleton. They can have a lot of disease. It wouldn't be what I would call low volume. Um, and this definition was all based on standard imaging of bone scan and CT. The other definitions that have been used was the one from Estro ACROP Delphi Consensus. And ACROP is the Advisory Committee for Radiation Oncology Practice. It's a European organization. And they defined oligometastatic as a maximum of five lesions. And the HORAD trial, which is pretty well known by Bove, published in European Urology in 2018, said fewer than five lesions. So you've got kind of three, four, five, and bringing in the uh, presence or absence of visceral mets. So should the prostate be treated in the presence of concurrent oligometastatic disease? And this is something we never would have considered at all um, before the uh, um, uh, well, before the stampede trial came out, but it was, you know, we just you said, well, I'm sorry, the horse is out of the barn, you're going to have androgen deprivation. But the stampede trial came out, published in The Lancet by Parker in 2018, and this was a phase three randomized multicenter trial of patients from Switzerland and the UK, metastatic disease, accrued 2,000 patients between 2013 and 2016. And they had, were put on lifelong androgen deprivation, which is the standard of care, compared to androgen deprivation plus radiation to the prostate. And they used two different schemas of radiation. One was 36 gray in six fractions over six weeks, so one fraction per week and a saber type of treatment. And the other was 55 gray in 20 fractions over four weeks. Both these doses are low. They wouldn't be used nowadays for definitive treatment, but then these guys have metastatic disease, so why you wouldn't be really necessarily trying to use definitive treatment. Um, their metastatic burden in the stampede trial was defined by Chartred. 40% of the men had low burden disease and 54% high burden. Uh, so they had only standard imaging, bone scanner CT, and if it was lymph node only metastases, they were considered low burden. This was reported with a median follow up of three years. And what they found was that median survival was the same in both arms, 46 months versus 48 months. Three-year overall survival was 62 versus 65. There was no difference whether you treated the prostate with radiation. But overall survival was improved in patients with a low metastatic burden, with a hazard ratio of 0.68. And it was a pretty significant difference. The three-year overall survival for it was 73% with ADT and 81% if you treated the prostate. And overall failure-free survival was improved with radiation as well with a hazard ratio of 0.76. Interestingly, there was no difference in symptomatic local events. And you would think radiation of the prostate might help decrease local events, but that's probably due to the suboptimal radiation dose. And adverse events were the same in both arms and very low. Uh, this was updated last year, 2022, by Parker again, and now the median follow-up is five years, and radiation to the prostate improves overall survival in low burden disease. Hazard ratio is 0 0.64, um, and there, there's with and this there's no price for this because there was no difference in quality of life or local events with the local radiotherapy. So you can see here on the curve, the overall survival for low burden disease is quite significantly improved with uh, local radiation to the prostate. 
The median, and it's a big improvement, it's almost two years. The median survival in the low burden group was 64 months for standard of care versus 86 months for adding radiation. And five year survival was improved from 53% to 65%. So this is, this is the new standard of care. This is something that is definitely worth doing. Um, in the high burden group, there was no difference. Median survival was 39 versus 41 months. And both radiation schedules were equally effective. Whether you gave 36 gray and six fractions or the four weeks of daily treatments, uh, they both uh, conferred the same advantage. Um, there was no difference in symptomatic local events between the two arms. 59% of men had at least one symptomatic local event. It was 608 in the standard of care arm, 601 in the, with the added radiation. 53% um, at least one local event intervention. Again, no difference. And the two-year grade three adverse events in the radiation arm were only 0.5% for GU, 1% for GI. So again, this doesn't come at a high price um, so it's a very worthwhile treatment. So in conclusion for Stampede, prostate local radiation improves overall survival for men with low burden oligometastatic prostate cancer with no impact on long-term quality of life. Uh, low burden, again, was defined by standard imaging. If we start doing PSMA PETs on everybody, we're not going to find as nearly as many men with low burden disease. Um, but the other thing to consider here is our current standard of care with, for men with newly diagnosed hormone-sensitive metastatic prostate cancer would include an ERAT with the ADT. And we don't know what that effect is going to have on the survival benefit that we saw with prostate radiation. But I think the general conclusion is it's reasonable to offer both. So you put them on ADT and an ERAT and you irradiate the prostate. So what about treating the metastases? Now, this is a different question. So there's a few trials here, which I'll go through. STOMP, which stands for Surveillance or Metastasis-Directed Therapy for Oligometastatic Prostate Cancer, uh, was published in JCO in 2018 by OST. It's a phase two randomized multicenter trial. Uh, biochemical for recurrence after definitive primary treatment with three or fewer extracranial metastases, they use choline PET for the staging. And these men were randomized to either surveillance or treatment of the metastases with either metastectomy or SABER to all lesions. Um, the group was stratified for P by PSA doubling time, less than or greater than three months, and nodal versus non-nodal. Uh, the endpoint was ADT-free survival, and ADT was given for either symptomatic progression, progression to more than three lesions, or progression at a treated site. And they reported with a median follow-up of five years. So you can see here that the median ADT free survival was 13 months on the surveillance group and 21 months for the metastasis directed therapy. Um, they found that treating the metastasis was beneficial regardless of the nodal status and PSA doubling time. Um, and what they recommended was advanced imaging, PSMA PET, and a short course of ADT at the time of giving the metastasis directed therapy. So surveillance for someone with metastasis is probably, uh, would not be considered the standard now, but a short course of ADT with metastasis-directed therapy. The next study to look at is the Oriel, um, published by Phillips in JAMA Oncology in 2020. This was a phase two trial for oligometastatic prostate cancer at one to three sites, so they had a stricter definition. Staging was by CT, bone scanner, MRI, Interestingly, PSMA PETs were done but not used, um, and they were randomized two to one to SABER versus observation. They stratified them for the primary management, whether that was radiation or surgery to the primary, uh, PSA doubling time, and whether they'd had prior ADT. And the primary endpoint was six months progression with a PSA rise greater than two nanograms per mil. And again, the thing to consider here is either it's either SABER or observation. And again, that's not something we would normally be considering. The, one of the interesting aspects of this trial was that they did quantitative sequencing of the T cell receptor repertoires to elucidate peripheral immunological response to SABER, because we know that single large doses of radiation to the cancer can induce a, uh, um, an immunologic response. 
They also use color genomics as uh, a hereditary, hereditary cancer test to determine the frequency of germline DNA repair mutations. And uh, they profiled plasma match leukocyte DNA for the analysis of circulating tumor DNA. So it had this uh, basic uh, research components. And you can see here in the graphs, um, for progression-free survival, there is an advantage for treating the metastatic disease, also in biochemical survival. Uh, six months PSA progression was 11% in those that had their metastasis treated versus 50% uh, on observation. And the other thing was, it was they had a better outcome if no lesions were left untreated. In terms of the genomics and immune response in this trial, um, the peripheral blood mononuclear cells were collected at baseline in day 90 for sequencing of the T cell receptor DNA. And clusters of similar expanded T cell receptors were detected in the SABR participants, again suggesting an immunologic response. Uh, the uh, tumors were also screened for high-risk mutations. And progression-free survival was significantly longer with SABR in patients who didn't have the high-risk mutations. So in the graphs, you can see uh, if they have a high-risk mutation, uh, there's still an improvement in treating the metastatic sites. But if there's no high-risk mutation, they have a, a, a more substantial improvement. And then the bottom graph compares metastasis-directed therapy according to whether or not there was a high-risk mutation. So the red graph, they didn't have a high-risk mutation. They did better than the ones that did have a high-risk mutation. The next thing to look at is can metastasis-directed therapy increase the off-treatment interval with intermittent androgen deprivation. And this is something that's, um, I think, a very interesting concept. This was presented by Tang from MD Anderson at Astro last fall. And uh, what they looked at was the, called the EXTEND trial. And uh, the addition of metastasis directed therapy to intermittent hormone therapy for oligometastatic prostate cancer, multicenter randomized phase two trial, in the abstract, they did not specify what staging investigations were used, whether they included a PSMA PET or not. Uh, but they could have up to five metastases. Uh, the primary had to be previously treated. If not, it had to be. Uh, they were randomized to six months of ADT with or without metastasis-directed therapy. So that, that's, a, I think, a really interesting concept. They would resume androgen deprivation on progression. 87 patients were randomized, 60% had had prior surgery, and about 15% prior radiotherapy. So this shows that uh, progression-free survival was indeed extended. The median progression-free survival was 16 months on ADT versus uh, not yet reached on ADT with the metastasis-directed therapy, and they had a median follow-up of 22 months. So you can see metastasis-directed therapy plus six months of ADT is here in the red line, and the other ones uh, were just on the ADT. They also had a significant prolongation of progression-free survival after testosterone recovery, which may have quite useful quality-of-life benefits, which uh, is something that um, when you're using intermittent therapy, you always say, well, recovery of the testosterone is a two-edged sword. You'll feel better, but then you're going to need more treatment sooner. And if you can prolong that interval, that can be very helpful. And finally, looking at the uh, estro acrop delphi consensus for oligometastatic prostate cancer, they got together 25 uh, radiation oncologists who were considered experts in this topic and uh, used three rounds of questions to achieve consensus. They were looking at uh, de novo oligometastatic castrate-sensitive disease, oligo-recurrent castrate-sensitive prostate cancer, and oligo-progressive castrate-resistant. 88% um, of the group definitely preferred PSMA PET imaging for staging and restaging. Uh, they felt the most useful definition was for oligo disease was a maximum of five lesions. And they felt that age did not disqualify a patient from being offered metastasis-directed therapy. For de novo, oligometastatic castrate-sensitive disease, uh, the group felt that if they were initially staged with the standard imaging, that should be confirmed with a PSMA PET. 
Uh, they all agreed, or most, that treatment should be to all sites, including the primary nodes and any bone metastases, and should also include systemic treatment. For oligorecurrent hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, uh, they felt that the time interval since original treatment was not a consideration. Uh, they recommended systemic treatment plus metastasis-directed therapy to all sites, and that the duration of androgen deprivation should be at least six months. For oligoprogressive hormone-resistant prostate cancer, again, metastasis-directed therapy to all lesions, and obviously change your systemic treatment. So in conclusion, uh, prostate should be treated despite oligometastatic disease if there's a low burden. Um, th this results in about two-year increase in overall survival. Metastasis-directed therapy is a way to defer the start of systemic treatment or, importantly, I think, lengthen the time interval between a switch in treatment um, in your systemic treatment and uh, prolong the interval in uh, off-treatment intervals in intermittent therapy. Uh, SABER to all metastases by conventional imaging will improve progression-free survival, and the outcome can possibly be enhanced by total consolidation of disease identified on a PSMA PET. SABER in large fraction radiation, which could be SABER, could be HDR brachytherapy, induces a systemic immune response, and we don't know how beneficial that's going to be. Um, a baseline immune phenotype and tumor mutation status may predict benefit from SABER, and uh, we still need prospective randomized trials with integrated imaging and biological correlates. Thank you.